Good morning. It is quite an honor to be here this morning. I, I, um, it was great to be here yesterday, and I felt so welcomed um, by everyone from the Embrace BC Symposium. And I want to start out first by acknowledging that I'm standing on sacred land, the unceded territory of Coast Salish peoples and their ancestors, and I want to express my gratitude to Muskegon, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations who are connected to this territory. And I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. You know, this is such a rare convening when we have an opportunity to bring anti-racism and multiculturalism groups together. And I want to give pause and give our gratitude to the heroes and cheeros whose shoulders we stand on. You know, the people that came before us that worked in social justice and civil rights and on racism, we are here today because of them. I want to thank Embrace BC's leadership for convening the symposium and, and especially thank Carmen for her patience and hospitality and I really appreciate the invitation to be here today. I feel it's important to situate myself and to be transparent. So I, I have to start off by first breaking one of the cardinal rules about uh, presenting, and that's telling you what I don't know. As a USer visiting British Columbia, I'm not steeped in the history of racism here in Canada and specifically in British Columbia. You know, in preparing for this presentation, I did the internet research. I read a couple books. Carmen was very patient with and sent me lots of different materials for me to help my learning curve in this area. But I know I have the Cliff Notes version. And so I know a little bit more about the history. I know a little bit more about the relationship between the government and First Nations people. I know, uh, have a sense of the evolution of immigration policies and also the creation of the Multiculturalism Act and its impact and the different perspectives regarding its impact, which we had a chance to discuss yesterday. Though I know that there's differences to the history of racism in Canada and the United States, there are definitely similarities. When we look at how racism manifests itself in institutions, when we look at the structural arrangements of racism, when we look at the accumulated advantages of whites, all of this tells the story of how racism impacts our lives and the systems that we operate in every day. One of the other ways that racism is similar is because of the unremitting gaps between people of color and whites in such basic areas as education and health and employment. Each of these gaps can be debilitating and destructive. And though this is a list of racial disparities, just a few of here in British Columbia, I can share a similar list of racial disparities in Baltimore, Maryland, where I'm based. Race is consistently an indicator of how a person of color may fare in a given institution. And though there are similarities between how racism plays out, I also want to acknowledge that Canada's response to racism is different how the U.S. has responded. You know, based on my knowledge, the U.S. government does not have a government department that uses the term publicly anti-racism. It does not offer funding to multiculturalism and anti-racism groups that support their work with a common goal of eliminating racism and promoting multiculturalism. We don't have a multiculturalism week. Now, I know I'm an outsider looking in, but I think it's always important to acknowledge progress and, and the level of support that's happening here in Canada. So what do I do? I describe my work at MP Associates as building the capacity of communities and organizations to address structural racism and to understand white privilege so we can work toward a more just and inclusive society, which you know doesn't usually win an award for an elevator speech. Um, I also want to say that I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm a white woman doing my own personal work and I'm working in community with others on structural racism. So today, 
Today I'm talking about building the capacity of anti-racism and multiculturalism groups here in British Columbia. And what I'd like to do is share three things. One, I want to talk about why don't we work together all the time? You know, why should we bother? What are the benefits of doing that? And what are some ways that we can do our next steps, do it better? You know, I think Eric Wong, when he was moderating the panel yesterday, he talked about safety and uncomfortable. So we're going to get to the uncomfortable stage because we're going to talk about differences and we're going to talk about tensions. And I think it's an important place when we're looking at building capacity that we need to think about. So where I'd like to start is what do we believe is possible? When we say we want to eliminate racism and promote multiculturalism, what would it look like? What's going to be different in British Columbia 20 years from now? How will we know if we're making progress? You know, sometimes we move so fast. You know, we have to reach our objectives by the end of the year. We have to do that funder's report. We have to pay the bills. All that's going on, so we don't always have time to reflect on what is possible. So I want to invite you to reflect with me on what could be different 20 years from now. So put your papers down, put your pens down, and if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And if you don't feel comfortable, find an object in the room and just focus in on it. Take a deep breath. Take another one. And picture where you're living right now. Picture where you eat your meals, where you go to sleep, where you just relax. And take another deep breath. And I want you to step outside where you're living right now and picture yourself interacting with neighbors, talking to neighborhood business owners, interacting with children playing. What could a multicultural neighborhood look like? What does social inclusion look like? What would a neighborhood look like if racism was no longer present? And when you think of the children in your neighborhood, think about them going to school, interacting with teachers, learning new things, playing with their schoolmates, what could a multicultural school look like? What would a school where racism is no longer present look like? What would be the policies? What would be different when the children graduated from high school? And when we think of those same neighbors who may need health care and have to go to the hospital, what does a multicultural hospital look like? What would it mean if your neighbor went to a hospital in which racism was no longer present? Just let your mind wander. What is possible in British Columbia if we fully promoted multiculturalism and eliminated racism. And I want you to open your eyes, take another deep breath, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and describe your vision. And we'll take a couple minutes and do this. So I hope you take a moment later and, and write down some of the words that you use to describe your vision. And I encourage you to take it out now and then. 
and on a regular basis and take a look at it. Because our vision is typically our internal driver. And sometimes it's challenging to balance being grounded in our vision while trying to do our daily work. And I know for myself, I can get lost in the politics of something or, you know, I have that long things to do list and I'm trying to check everything off or I'm analyzing the, the group situation that I was just in previously. But for me, I need to believe that we're making progress forward. So I have two reasons for starting this presentation with us focusing on our vision. First, I think it's important for groups promoting multiculturalism and eliminating racism to regularly ask ourselves this question. Is what we're doing right now in our work of the highest quality? And is it sufficient to reach our vision? I believe that we need to hold up the mirror to ourselves and work to ask ourselves the hard questions. I know I have some great folks in my family, you know, who pat me on the back and say, boy, Maggie, you know, you're doing the heavy lifting. You're talking about race. None of us want to talk about race. You know, I'm glad you're out there trying to change the world. And sometimes when we get that level of acknowledgement, we don't always take time to critique what we're doing. And most importantly, we don't take time with each other to give each other the feedback that we need to continuously improve what we're doing and to be more effective. Second, I doubt any organization represented here has figured out the magic potion to eliminate racism. If you have, raise your hand because I really want to meet you. But the next question I have for us is how are we working together collectively to achieve this vision? We know one organization can't eliminate racism by itself. We don't have enough power, enough resources. We need each other. And it's been my experience, and maybe it's been yours, that sometimes when folks working on racism gather together, we have these tensions that play out. We have different ways of doing things, different political analysis, different methods, different strategies. And we check each other out. We sort of put ourselves through this gamlet. When I was working at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and this was a center that was founded in 1970 to support black leaders that were coming out of the civil rights movement that were being elected to Congress, and this was a center that supported them. I worked with colleagues on the creation of a new network which grew out of President Bill Clinton's initiative on race. It was called Neighbor. Network of Alliances Bridging Race and Ethnicity. And by the end of this project, we had a network of 194 organizations, race relations and racial justice organizations in 35 states. And this network was governed by an advisory group of 28 local and national groups. And there was tension on that advisory group. You know, it played out that groups had different strategies, um, we had different worldviews on how change happens. And then there was power dynamics between the national organizations and the grassroots organization. And what we found when we started our discussion is that the group's approaches typically boil down to three. And I'm simplifying their description because it's a PowerPoint and we don't have a lot of time, but I think you'll get the three. So the different approaches are some believed that it was about building individual and institutional knowledge and competencies and awareness to address racism, and that was sufficient. And then there were others that believed it was about bringing people together across races and ethnicities and working collectively together on an issue, and that would lead to change. And then there were some organizations that believed it was about changing laws and about changing policies and practices and that was the key to change. You know, we had many long conversations and retreats, and eventually we created uh, an organizational framework that affirmed this spectrum of approaches and said we have our, our intent is that we're gonna collectively work together on dismantling racism. And one of the things that I really appreciate about Neighbor is I think so many times in organization you create the framework and then you're done, you know, everyone gets a handout and we call it a day, right? 
Well, we took it on the road. We had a national how-to forum, and we brought organizations that represented these different approaches together. And then we further, we took it out to four communities, and we tried out a process of how we could work interdependently together. And what we found is that there was a set of common barriers that came up. You know, one of the barriers was that working collaboratively takes time. You know, sometimes it feels like it's taking time away from our work. You know, when we're thinking about we have to build trust and build relationships. Um, and when organizations have limited capacity, you know, it, it feels like, you know, where is this taking us? Is it worth the time? Another barrier that came up was around funding. One of the things that funders ask us is, why should I fund you? Well, in order to make my case to fund me, sometimes I have to say why you shouldn't fund these folks over here. The funding process creates this adversarial relationship amongst us. Another barrier is doing our work is sometimes just looking at our singular impact. You know, when we report to our constituents or our board members or our clients, we talk about our accomplishments. We don't talk about it in the context of all the other organizations that are working on this as well. It's our singular impact, yet it's on this big issue. The other barrier that came up was around, are we a field or aren't we? You know, for a field, then do we have uh, accountability? mechanisms? Do we have principles? Do we have professional standards? And then another barrier is around the appropriateness and the effectiveness of different strategies. Is it more important to train people to act? Is it more important to change policy through the legal system? Is it about organizing people most impacted to demand change in policies? Whose way is the right way? And one of the most intractable tensions that came up when we had these gatherings was among groups that were reforming institutions and transforming institutions. Though at first glance they may seem as polar opposites, they're really, if done well, the ebb and flow of social change. You know, there's assumptions that if you're reforming an organization, you're colluding with the status quo. And if you're transforming, a, uh, institutions, you're naive, and your objective is unachievable. And so it's so important to heighten our awareness and understand the cycle of change, you know, the historical patterns of how racism mutates, as well as um, the stages of social change movements, so we can understand how reform and transform interact with each other. Do any of these barriers sound familiar? Yes? No? Yes? I can go home now. I mean, if this is what <laughs> Well, what I want to do is I want to take it to the next step. And I want us to have a chance to identify some of the elephants in the room. I think it's really important for us to understand our different perspectives and the different ways that we think change happens. So I'm going to ask each of you to take a stand this morning. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I'm going to ask you to make a, a choice. So it is a forced choice exercise, so I'll say that up front because forced choice frustrates people because there's no middle ground. Um, but it's a helpful process for us to start identifying and because I'm right before lunch, it gives you great lunchtime dialogue. So I'm hoping that you'll use that, that time well. So put your papers down, we're moving. It's right before lunch and I, I want you guys moving. So, Put your papers down, gather in the middle of the room, and I'll take you through a series of questions. So this is a, a exercise, it's called Take a Stand. And it's an exercise that was created by Gita Gulati Parti at Open Source Leadership Strategies. She's based in Durham, North Carolina. Her and I do a lot of work on building the capacity of organizations to work on racial equity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, you'll see two statements come up and you're gonna move to your left or move to your right depending on your choice. 
It's your left or right, not mine. I'm going to keep my hands to the side so I don't point and then create problems. And um, so what I like to do is when, you, when we make our choices is for you to notice where people end up and also notice what comes up for you in, in making your decision. And depending on how time is going, we'll take a minute or two and try and do some dialogue around this as well. You ready? Okay. So the first one. For those who work to achieve peace, move to your left. And for those who work to achieve justice, move to your right. Okay, you only have a minute to decide. This is, uh, if you work to achieve peace, move to your left. What was that? Well, and sort of don't hang out in the middle. I'm the middle, so there should be nobody in front of me. You should be somewhere else. <laughs> so notice, notice where people end up. Notice what came up for you, where, even for folks I could see that are trying to really hard be in the middle and, and be on both sides of this. Okay, so the next one. For those who believe we are fundamentally more similar than different, move to your left. And for those who believe we are fundamentally more different than similar, move to your right. Okay, just take a minute and do this. Wow. Wow. Okay, we got some, we got some folks hanging out. That's great. So just notice. Okay, ready for the next one? Okay, if you believe that individuals change institutions, move to your left. And if you believe that institutions change individuals, move to your right. Ooh, that's a hard one. Ooh. I know. <laughs> Come on, take just a minute and make a change. <laughs> I don't want anybody in the middle. Okay, so notice. Notice how, who uh, decided to stay. So this is your lunchtime conversation. So if folks are at your table, you can ponder more about this. Okay, here's a good one. If you're working to reform institutions, move to your left. And if you're working to transform institutions, move to your right. That's a hard one. <laughs> well, we're getting to that. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> okay. Okay, for this last one, you actually have three choices. So, okay, excited? Okay. So if you believe change must start with beliefs, move to your left. If you believe change must start with behaviors, stay in the middle. And if you believe change must start with relationships, move to your right. I know. <laughs> okay, notice. Think about what came up for you and notice where people landed. Okay, last one. If you believe change needs to be led from the bottom up, move to your left. If you believe change needs to be led from the middle out, move to the middle. And if you believe change needs to be led from the top down, move to your right. Yes. That, that's in the middle. You're right there. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so again, notice where people landed and notice what came up for you and have a seat.
Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that'll get us through the last half hour before lunch and your stomach won't grumble that much and you'll stay with me. <laughs> so in a longer process, if we had more time, I would actually have you stay in each of your caucuses of choice and then we would eventually do some fish bowls to be able to have some different conversations. But we would talk about what grounds this belief. Why did you land where you landed? What are the strengths? What are the limitations? And what's the opportunity we have to collaborate with each other? So I encourage you to have, continue this discussion over lunch. You know, pursuing the path of interdependence um, is really an opportunity for a catalyst for movement building. But I know, you know, when you take a look at that exercise and the barriers that I talked, talked about, if we have so many differences, why bother? You know, if, let's, so going back to the story about neighbor, when we took this on the road, not only did we come up with barriers, we also had benefits that came up too. And one of them was looking at the patterns historically in movement building about the divide and conquer strategy. You know, by working collectively together, we can be more proactive when it comes up. And when we have those trust and relationships, we can avoid getting hooked by it. You know, this just came up in the US. I don't know if you heard about it, but the National Organization for Marriage created this wedge strategy for President Obama's two major constituents, African Americans and gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. This was a report that got out that wasn't supposed to get out that explains their wedge strategy. Fortunately, there was relationships that were already starting with the national organizations for African Americans and gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender. So they, they work through this and there's some incredible collaboration that's going on right now. So it's, a, is this on? it's important to stand together. Um, another benefit is sometimes we get so focused on working on our piece of the pie, getting it. And we don't always think about when we work collaboratively, we have a chance to build the pie. Thank you. Um, so we can understand and have an opportunity to be innovative. We have an opportunity to understand our unique role of how our approaches work in the community change process and to be clear on how we can work collectively together. The other thing is when we take a look at it, we know that racism mutates. We know that retrenchment occurs. So it's important for us to be learning how to adapt our strategies, how to ensure there's multi-level approaches and so we can initiate and sustain change. So I want us for a moment to consider, will building interdependent and collective relationships with organizations using different strategies bolster our effectiveness in addressing systemic racism in communities? I believe it can. And I want to be really clear, by no means am I presenting interdependence as a missed opportunity or a judgment. We know too well how the system of racism operates. I'm offering that the time is ripe now the opportunity is here. And so what I wanna to get to is some next steps. So hopefully um, each of you received a handout and if you didn't raise your hand and we'll make sure you get the, the handout. Um, and I'll be sending out the PowerPoint presentation so you'll have these slides. Um, part of this process is about knowing ourselves. You know, when we did the national forum and the pilot workshops, prior to even having the groups come in the same room together, we asked them to go through organizational reflection questions. And the handout, the first couple pages of the handout, is a sample of those questions that we had organizations answer. You know, the questions can help build clarity on why you're doing what you're doing. You know, the questions can also help us answer the earlier questions. Is what you're doing sufficient? and how can we work with others? The other thing about knowing ourselves, 
if we're out there saying that we're promoting multiculturalism and eliminating racism, we need to look inside. We need to look at our own policies. We need to look at our own governance structure. We need to look at our recruiting practices. Is there alignment between our principles and what we do internally? Because it's so important that we are building our integrity, our credibility within communities, and making sure that that alignment exists. Another next step is about a community of practice for organizations focused on multiculturalism and anti-racism. And this discussion was happening uh, last night with a practitioner's discussion. You know, a community of practice is simply a group of people that have a passion for something and they want to do it better and they're willing to make that commitment. One of the things that could happen here in terms of a community practice is groups coming together and co-creating a vision together and incorporating accountability with each other to push our learning, to create principles with each other of do no harm, and also taking time to celebrate our progress. One of the um, pilot sites that we had was in Knoxville, and they continued their interdependent process. And these were some of the questions when that community group came together. They looked at a particular issue, they asked about the racial implications, and they asked what each organization did and tried to figure out where were the conflicts to figure out how they could work better together. The third one is creating a strong and effective message. I don't know if you've seen these pictures. This is from Hurricane Katrina right after it happened. These were by two different print photographers. You know, on this one, it's so obvious what's going on, right? It was easy to call the photographers on the carpet the difference of who is looting and who just happened to find food. Two very different messages. Very obvious. You know, but as groups, we have a hesitancy to talk about race. John Powell provides a couple of reasons you know, in terms of uh, different ways that we get caught up in not wanting to be explicit about race. And I, I encourage you, if you haven't had an opportunity to check out John Powell's work, and it is lowercase, um, it's a great person to check out, and he has lots of YouTube videos, so I encourage you to look at him as a resource. But part of working toward transformational change is about shifting discourse. It's so important for us to be explicit about race. When we don't take time to explain or we use coded language, then it's so easy for someone to insert their bias, their stereotypes when we don't tell the full story. Research findings tell us the importance of helping the listener to understand the concepts as well as to connect with the values. And I wanna showcase how this played out. I don't know if you're familiar, what's, uh, one of the things that's going on right now is in 30 states, there are voter suppression laws that are trying to get on the books. And so it's, you have to have a government issued, non-expired photo ID in order to vote. And so I wanted to showcase to you two organizations who had two different messages about voter suppression. Both of them are progressive. Both of them have a commitment of racial justice. But I want you to see the difference in how they talked about it. So here's the first one. If you just read the second bullet. Does anybody see race in the second bullet? Not there. Okay, now let's look at message two. One, a very different percentage being put out there. Two, making a connection to folks on their common value of fairness. That's where you want to connect people when you talk about race. And also putting some historical context that we want to educate people on how things have happened over the years. So here's some messaging tips from Alan Jenkins. Alan Jenkins used to be the executive director of the Advancement Project. He just became program officer at Kellogg Foundation. Uh, but he has some great hints about leading with values and talking systematically about the, the human story. But a community of practice 
has an opportunity to strategically use messages to educate the public, to move people to action, and to eventually change the discourse so we are talking a common language regarding um, values. There's been a lot of research and toolkits in the past five years about framing messages around race. And in the second part of your handout is a list of resources, and a couple of those I've put on there. So I encourage you to take advantage of checking those out. Okay, the last next step. Is, or maybe not. <laughs> okay, understanding the collective impact. How many people like to do evaluation? Yeah, not many hands. You know, it's not really on you know, our top five list to get out there and to do evaluation. But so many times we're asked to evaluate our isolated impact on this really complex issue of multiculturalism and racism. You know, the, in our funders report, you know, there's not a question to say how the elections came out. There's not a question about what was the racial incident. There's not a question for you to provide historical context so they have a sense of the change that's happening. And it's so critical to know how other organizations are contributing to the change process and analyzing data. Otherwise, what we're doing is just focusing on our singular impact. You know, typically in most organizations, you have your workshop evaluation, right? And you find out if your workshop was affected. And then for other organizations, you have your client satisfaction survey, and you find out if the client was satisfied. And both of those are important. It helps us to be accountable to the people that we serve, right? But that information is not sufficient for us to know, is what we're doing every day going to reach our vision? That's not the data we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at data across the community. So some of you may be familiar with um, this article that came out in the Stanford Social Innovation Review by John Candy and Mark Kramer. And in this article, it describes a group called STRIVE. STRIVE is an organization that works on student achievement. And it tells a story how one of, in one of their communities, a core group of community leaders abandoned their individual agendas in favor of a collective approach. The leaders decided not to fixate on one strategy in education, such as better after school programs. They decided to create this ambitious mission and to coordinate their collective work so they were able to support every stage of a young person's life from cradle to career. What Kenny and Kramer found in their research that successful collective impact initiatives required five conditions. I, I have time, right? Okay. So I'm going to, let me do the phone. Wait, you can wait there. This is, this is a short video that explains those five conditions. Collective impact. Diverse organizations coming together to solve a complex social problem. When faced with malnutrition, collective impact means a healthier person. GAIN, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, demands global participation, working to fortify the world's food supply. Here's how they use collective impact. Common agenda. This means all parties agree to shared goals. Healthy lives from fortified nutrition. Shared measurement, keeping track of the same things. Reducing nutrient deficiencies around the world. Mutually reinforcing activities. Each actor doing their own part, using their unique skills.
Continuous communication, regularly sharing results with each other. Monitoring progress across channels. Backbone organization, a support team that helps mobilize, coordinate, and facilitate to keep the goal in sight and the progress rolling. Helping 400 million people, one grain at a time. Channeling our collective strength, we can solve the world's toughest problems. Collective impact. Diverse organizations coming together to solve a complex social problem. Okay. That wasn't exactly the video I wanted to show, but it gives you an idea about the five conditions. What I think is important, I, I like collective impact evaluation. I think it's very innovative. But in the literature that I've seen, there isn't typically a racial equity analysis. So I want to share with you one group who is working toward adopting collective impact, and they're adding three more conditions to Canny and Kramer's to show that. And plus, they're just an incredible initiative. Um, some of you may be familiar with the City of Seattle's Race and Social Justice Initiative. This was an initiative that was started about eight years ago. Uh, Mayor Greg Nichols, who was candidate at the time, was going on the campaign trail, and he was going to neighborhood to neighborhood. And as a white guy, he was like, hmm, it looks like neighborhoods are getting different city services, and it looks like it's based on race. So one of the first things that he did when he took office was he wanted to eliminate institutional racism in City Hall. What's exciting about this, this was sustained over two mayoral administrations. It was unanimously supported by city council. And so they worked for a couple years internally on building the capacity of staff to understand what structural racism was, what white privilege was. And one of the outgrowths that happened is they created the Race and Social Justice Community Roundtable. And this was a round table that came together to take a look. Now they're specifically looking at educational equity. And it's 26 organizations from community organizations, government, social service, and philanthropy. And I want to sh share one more short video of their work. I do want to say before I, um, though the focus on this is municipal government being a catalyst and leader, I want you to think about other containers. Think bigger, think provincial government, think federal, think First Nations, think about universities, other groups, a group of grassroots organizations that come together and be a catalyst. So don't get ca caught up in the municipal. So. And I'm going to stop this about halfway through, but it's on their website. Seattle has a national reputation for being politically progressive, culturally diverse, and economically prosperous. It is a city of distinctive, vibrant neighborhoods and innovative businesses. Why then does race play such a huge role in determining the quality of our lives? If you examine all key measures of well-being, Seattle has the same race-based disparities as any other city in the United States. Our race-based inequities mirror national trends, and many communities are losing ground. Imagine a city where I have the same likelihood of living a long, healthy life, whatever my race. I earn just as much as a white man doing the same job. Where race does not predict the likelihood of a person being homeless. A city where my baby will thrive and grow, no matter what race she is. I want to see a school system where regardless of race, culture, or language, my children are safe, included, and get what they need to succeed in school.
Imagine the city of Seattle when racial disparities no longer exist and racial equity has been achieved. This is the vision of the Seattle Race and Social Justice Initiative. The initiative works within city government and with community leaders to get to the root cause of racial inequity, institutional racism. RSJI is creating fundamental changes to achieve racial equity in city services and the broader community. This work is not new to Seattle. Community activists have been organizing to address race-based disparities in our communities for many years. Historically, city departments have also taken on that work. The initiative looks to expand on the history of that community organizing. RSJI focuses on racism because race has profoundly shaped public policies and institutions in the United States, including our national economy, housing, and employment. Institutional racism is not about personal prejudices based on race. It's about an underlying system of bias that works to the detriment of people of color and to the benefit of people who are white. First and foremost, for us to achieve racial equity, we have to be explicit about racism. We have to be explicit about institutional racism. We set out three primary goals for ourselves in this work. The first is to eliminate race-based inequities in our communities. To accomplish this critical work, we're partnering with the community to address disparities in key impact areas like education, health, criminal justice. The second goal is to strengthen the way the city engages the community and provides services. To move this work forward, we're looking at how to improve our outreach and public engagement to make it more inclusive, as well as improving access to services for the immigrant and refugee community. Our third goal is to end racial disparities internal to the city. To move this work forward, we're focusing on workforce equity or hiring and promotion policies within the city, as well as contracting equity, ensuring access to uh, city contracting dollars for women and minority owned businesses. When the initiative began, we focused on helping city employees understand institutional racism and addressing institutional racism within city government. Now we're expanding the initiative into the community by collaborating strategically with institutions and community organizations to end racial disparities in the community. In the summer of 2009, we convened the Race and Social Justice Community Roundtable, whose goal explicitly is to end racial inequity in the city of Seattle. We convened major institutions, community-based organizations, both those working on social change and providing social services, and philanthropy to strategize how to do that. Since we began meeting, we've narrowed our focus down to public high school graduation rates where major inequities exist. So why did El Centro de la Raza join the, the round table? I think you have to look at the history of the organization in the first place, in terms of starting with you know, an occupation of a building back in 1972, 37 years ago. I mean, the organization basically was founded because of um, institutional racism and the disparities that exist that existed in our community and still exist today. We have to come together in a coalition and solve together uh, and come up with solutions together on um, how we're going to tackle um, institutional racism and the racial disparities that exist in our communities. Pride Foundation was really excited and honored to join the round table. And there is a couple of reasons. First, we understand the intersections between racism and heterosexism and homophobia, and we understand that in order to be good allies, it's really important to stand up for issues other than the ones that are maybe most central to you. And the second reason that we joined is because um, just as it is important to be an ally, we recognize that for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community, it is our allies that have really helped us and worked with us and partnered with us to achieve the things that we have been able to achieve throughout our entire history. You can't do this work alone, you need allies, and it feels really great to be part of a larger community. RSGI's second goal works to achieve racial equity in public engagement. Okay, so that gives you a good sense of what they do, and there's more information on, on their website. I think what's 
um, interesting is they're trying to adopt the collective impact uh, valuation. And uh, what they did is they actually added three conditions, which is one, that there needs to be a shared analysis on structural racism um, and privilege, the importance of having a mix of season and emerging leadership, as well as, uh, excuse me, that decisions are substantially driven uh, by people of color and that there's collective accountability to communities of color. I do think this is an important group to watch, one, because of the work they're doing, but two, about the opportunity that they are integrating the collective impact evaluation with the racial equity lens. So in closing, I hope that you keep discussing what is possible. What is possible if we leverage different strategies to promote multiculturalism and anti-racism? What's possible if we work collectively? I encourage you to think about your vision. I hope you have a chance to sort of write down some of the pictures that came up for you and pull it out now and then. And ask yourselves, is what I'm doing today in my work leading me toward my vision? I definitely want to applaud each of you uh, for the work that you're doing. You're doing the heavy lifting in terms of what's going to make true transformational progress toward our vision of eliminating racism. And I also want to challenge you to think about how can we leverage our work? How can we work interdependently and build a movement for racial justice? I hope some of the ideas to, uh, that I shared with you today will inspire you to think about how to work collectively together. And I want to leave you with a quote by Anurate Roy. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. And on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you very much.